Hello friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech, my name is Alan. We've always known more or less that even the largest Star Destroyers are able to enter atmosphere, and some ships like the Venator class Star Destroyer are even able to land on ground, using special gear, but after seeing Rogue One, and that specific scene where an Imperial class Star Destroyer kind of just floats over the city as if the city's many various religious beliefs are keeping it afloat in a sea of belief, and I've been wondering just how exactly does a Star Destroyer do what it does? What technology is used to keep it afloat and able to allow it to defy gravity? And that's what we're going to be talking about today. First, we're going to look at the weight of the Imperial class Star Destroyer. Then we're going to look at how it's able to survive atmospheric entry. Then we're going to see how it's able to leave a planet's gravity well, followed by how it's able to maintain a constant altitude in atmosphere. First, in order to illustrate just how crazy the scenario is, let's figure out just how much an ISD weighs, because there's no real information about it in all of Star Wars canon. Now, this is a massive ship, pride of the Empire and backbone of the Imperial fleet. It measures at 1.6 kilometers long, which conveniently translates to one mile long. Using that length, Forbes.com, known for ranking the richest people in the world, and now apparently figuring out the size of science fiction ships, came up with an estimate of how much the ship weighed. As a starting point, they used the Allure of the Seas, one of the largest cruise ships in the world, measuring at 360 meters long. It would look like this put next to a Star Destroyer. The Allure of the Sea is quite massive by its own right and weighs around 100 million kilograms. Then by comparing the volume of the cruise ship and the Star Destroyer, they were able to figure out that the ISD is around 44.4 times more voluminous than the cruise ship, which means their estimate puts the Imperial Star Destroyer at a weight of 4.44 million kilograms. Kilograms. Now, there's a good reason why Forbes used the cruise ship. I mean, these are massive vessels designed to withstand the powerful rage and wrath of the ocean, along with the wrath of, you know, thousands of intoxicated pensioners, both of which could do severe damage to a ship's internal structure. The materials used need to be strong and also relatively lightweight so that the cruise ship can maintain some decent buoyancy. And because of the huge amount of people on board, safety standards on these ships are incredibly, incredibly strict. I mean, no cruise company wants a Rose and Jack situation to happen to their customers. Although we can't in good faith blame the Titanic's operating company for Jack's death, that was completely Rose's fault. Mythbuster actually proves it. If only Rose had slid over her overpampered privileged ass, then Jack wouldn't have gotten stuck in limbo for all those years. Modern cruise ships have a crazy amount of safety codes which make them quite difficult to build. Along with reinforced holes and airtight sealed compartments, there are several restrictions for the type of materials that can be used on a ship. For instance, wood and other more flammable materials are generally not allowed on the ship in large quantities, which is why you don't have a lot of wooden furniture or furnishings on a cruise ship. And unlike buildings, the entire ship, including most of the walls in the living area, are a part of the structure of the ship. And most cruise ships also have an MK-19 grenade launcher to deal with icebergs and Somalian pirates. So the cruise ship's design is probably the closest we're going to get as far as what we have here on Earth to an Imperial-class Star Destroyer. Now, were the ISD only meant for spaceflight and ever designed to enter atmosphere, it technically could be a lot lighter and structurally less reinforced. Like the ISS, for instance, its modular design is clearly made for zero-gravity environments only. It would definitely not be able to withstand the pressure of an atmospheric entry. The ISD is designed to withstand massive turbo laser strikes and able to operate around black holes and even enter a planet's gravity well. So I wouldn't be surprised if Forbes' estimate of 4.44 million kilograms is on the low side. So let's talk about atmospheric entry now. How does something that weighs 4.44 million kilograms withstand that much pressure? Well, for one, the Star Destroyer's massive size and increased surface area allows the craft to have a much slower descent than a small escape pod would. There's more material and therefore more air resistance spread across the hull. That's why the whole temperature of the space shuttle is going to be lower during re-entry than, say, the Apollo missions. While the ISD doesn't have a heat shield, I'm sure its outer hull, which is designed to resist turbo laser fire, can handle the intense heat. What's more of a problem is the massive weight of the ship encountering Earth's gravity when it enters the planetary gravity well. This will put a lot of stress on the one mile long structure of the ship. The larger your structure is, the stronger material strength you would need for your construction. Unless you have a workaround. Now, there are two pieces of technology in Star Wars that can help uh, reduce the air resistance and gravity of a craft while in atmosphere. 
First, we have the deflector shields, which are further split into three categories, ray shields, particle shields, and concussion shields. Concussion shields are mainly used for navigation and to stop debris from hitting the ship. Particle shields stop high velocity projectiles like proton torpedoes or A-wings. And ray shields stop radiation and energy weapons like turbo lasers. <laughs> These deflector shields used in conjunction also protect the ship's hull from increased friction during re-entry. Smaller starfighters use deflector shields to decrease air resistance, friction, and turbulence on the hull of their ship. This is quite important when your ship design had the same aerodynamic qualities as a flying brick. Next up, we have the bigger issue of gravity. Now, most Star Wars ships have what's known as an inertial compensator. This is kind of Star Wars' version of anti-gravity technology. We're not really sure exactly how these things work, but they were basically able to create a bubble where everything within it was shielded from the effects of gravity to a certain extent. Now, the primary reason why these devices were created was because of the crazy amount of thrust that these starships were capable of. Even the largest of ships, the massive Executor-class Super Star Destroyer, had a maximum acceleration rate of 1,230 Gs, while an Imperial-class Star Destroyer had an acceleration rate of 2,300 Gs. Even smaller ships like the X-Wing could hit 3,700 Gs. And that was just longitudinal Gs and not lateral. The average human blacks out after a few seconds of exposure to around 4 to 6 Gs, which can turn a 200-pound man quickly into an 8 to 1,200-pound man. This severely decreases the body's ability to supply blood to critical systems. For some people, that means the brain. For others, that's the groin area. So as you can imagine, you're going to need a lot of protection to keep your pilot from passing out at 3,700 Gs. Otherwise, you're going to be seeing a lot of this. Using inertial compensator, clone pilots were able to keep up with much more durable droid fighters that were more resilient to extreme acceleration. Some pilots like Han Solo were known for decreasing the inertial compensators just a bit so that they could get more tactile feel on how a ship is performing. Now, Imperial class star destroyers are usually built in close to zero gravity environments in orbital shipyards like the one over Corellia, Fondor, and Quat. This decreases the cost of construction immensely. You have materials mined from asteroids being turned into metal alloys in orbital foundries put together in orbital docks. Everything is weightless, so you don't really have to worry much about structural integrity when you're putting things together. But when the ISD begins to accelerate or deaccelerate, that's when they first begin testing the strength of the hull. So the ISD is technically weightless in space. That 4.44 million kilograms only comes into play when they're inside the gravity well of a planet. And at 3 Gs, which is about what the space shuttle experiences during re-entry, you're going to increase the weight of the ship from 4.44 million to 13.32 million kilograms. I mean, that is a huge increase of weight for the ISD's internal structure to be able to withstand. And we're not even looking at its top acceleration of 2300 Gs. So the inertial compensator is really the only thing that keeps the ISD from ripping itself apart during re-entry. And it's really the path to least resistance. Instead of creating a really, really strong hole or structure or using some kind of crazy material, you're just decreasing the weight by using anti-grav technology. As a matter of fact, one of the quickest ways to destroy the ISD is probably inserting a small covert team aboard and placing a timed explosive device on the inertial compensator. This way, the next time the ISD accelerates, its structural integrity will be compromised and the ship will rip itself apart. So trying to disable its supercomputer tracking device is kind of unnecessary. Just a note, this is all theoretical. Uh, we are not suggesting any of our viewers to go and sabotage our Emperor's most glorious fleet of Star Destroyers because that would be treason or terrorism. And we don't support that kind of stuff here on Generation Tech. Well, at least we didn't before the Battle of Jakku. So the deflector shields mitigate air resistance and the inertial compensator decreases the total weight of the ship. But apparently the compensators weren't powerful enough to make the Star Destroyer completely weightless. They still depended on massive ion engines to keep them afloat. Canon sources say that the engines were active on full strength for the entire time the ship was in atmosphere and any disruption to power would lead to a Jakku-like event. So that whole 2300 G top acceleration for the Star Destroyer only really works when it's weightless and in space. In atmosphere, its top speed was much lower. And this giant unwieldy craft could only reach a speed of 975 kilometers by using sheer brute force. This creates kind of a problem because we know that the escape velocity for Earth is around 11.2 kilometers per second. That translates to around 29,000 kilometers per hour or 18,000 miles per hour. So again, the inertial compensators must somehow lower the gravity of the planet 
so that the escape velocity is only 975 kilometers, the top speed for the Star Destroyer in atmosphere. So in order to do this, the inertial compensator on the ISD must decrease the gravitational pull of the Earth to 0.07% of its mass. That would also decrease the weight of the Imperial class Star Destroyer from 4.44 million kilos in atmosphere to just under 3,200 pounds, which is just a bit heavier than a Cessna. Now there's probably one other thing that doesn't make sense and you probably noticed it. While in atmosphere, the ISD's ion engines are actually pointing perpendicular to the surface of the planet. Now the only way the Star Destroyer could keep itself floating in this configuration is by using acceleration and lift of the giant vessel, which I'm sure isn't that aerodynamic, to keep it afloat. Ideally, if the ISD were able to hover, it would have to be configured with the engines directly downwards which would probably be quite disorienting for the crew. Which brings us to our next piece of technology, which really allows the ISD to float in atmosphere, the repulsor lift. This is a very common piece of technology we see everywhere in Star Wars. It's what Boba Fett uses to move around Han in a carbonite form. It's also what's used in most land speeders and speeder bikes, and also larger vehicles like the Separatist AAT. Repulsor lift technologies only worked within the proximity of a gravity well, and used coils of gravitic knots. Not really sure what that means, but I'm guessing this is some kind of space magic powered anti-gravity technology that we just can't understand here on Earth. Now, from what we can tell, larger ships like the Lucra Hulk Freighters used by the Separatists depended on this technology to allow these massive ships to land in atmosphere. Although there is no canon source that says that ISDs had repulsor lifts, I'm almost 100% sure that they would have. Most capital ships in their range do have this technology, and again, without it, the ISD would have to orient its engines directly towards the ground. An interesting side note about repulsor lift engines is apparently this technology was not compatible with deflector shields, which is why those Star Destroyers weren't able to slowly fly through the shield the Rebels used on Hoth, and just pummel their little snow igloos to oblivion. So, to sum it up, a Star Destroyer is able to fly in atmosphere not because of its incredible hull strength, but more because it manipulates gravity and turns its massive weight into something closer to a Cessna plane. Unfortunately, we probably won't be able to figure out this kind of technology until we launch Matthew McConaughey into a black hole. A sacrifice we'll probably have to make one day for the sake of humanity. Maybe we should start a change.org petition, because that is really the only way we'll be able to make something that massive and have it fly out of our atmosphere. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I really love doing these videos where we kind of look into how Star Wars science or pseudoscience kind of works and how to make sense of all the crazy ships that we see in universe. Anyway guys, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. And as usual, thanks for joining us. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.